Welcome back to Behind the Scenes of the Waltons and part three of my conversation with John Walmsley. If you're enjoying these, please do hit like and subscribe. You, you started that by talking about Earl contacting you because of what a terrific job you did creating the Walton Christmas together again, that, that CD. Um, I think a lot of people don't realize that the original vinyl one that was done during the course of the show was not us. Aside from Will Gear uh, narrating yes. something, people think it's us and it right. wasn't we weren't asked to be a part of it. We weren't invited to be a part of it. And I, right, I think, right. You know. Well, I, I was very disappointed yeah. at the time because obviously I was playing music and, and writing music at the time. So uh, the fact that we were not included was, you know, it felt a little bit hurtful, um, to be honest. I, I mean, I, I've never heard it. I never yeah. listened to it, you know, because I thought, well, this is not me. I don't want to have anything to do with it. I've certainly signed a few of them because people wanted an autograph and, and we always tell them mm -hmm. it's not, a, if, you, if you look at the fine print on the back, it says songs performed by the holiday singers. And basically, I don't know who produced it, but what they did is they brought a bunch of session singers into a studio and they said, you're supposed to be the Waltons. So sing badly. You know, sound sound like amateur singers. So um, I'm sure it was professionally done, but as you say, it's not us. So yeah, they could have had us in, and we could have sung just as badly. Just as badly. <laughs> some of right. some of us could. I don't Absolutely. know that you can sing badly, but you know, for the rest of us at that <laughs> time, I think we could have admirably <laughs> sounded like <laughs> us. Um, but then, of course, we had that wonderful, you gave us that wonderful opportunity to come in and create something that really was us. Us, yeah. Yeah, and I well, love I that I CD. Kind of, I kind of felt, again, I sort of felt a, a duty to set the record straight, you know, yeah. and, and we got we got everybody on it. We, we had Earl on it, and we had Ralph, we had Michael. Richard. Um, yeah. Richard, yes. And they, you know, they they... Uh, begged off as far as you know singing but they said but you know we'll 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 read something you know we'll be on it so I wrote um you know between the songs I wrote a bit of dialogue so they were involved with that and they and Ralph and Michael did this beautiful song oh. where they um they actually spoke the lyric to each other yeah which was not what I had planned but it was very nice it's beautiful it really worked. yeah and What's so disappointing, and I don't know if you have any updated news, but people ask where they can find it, and I don't know if they can at all. Yes, well, people people say they find it here and there, in, like eBay or something, some used well, copy. Yeah, or the sometimes at the cutout bins at you know at big lots or something. Um, what happened at the time was. Um, the company that uh, that put the CD out was going out of business as it was released. And then it was bought by another company and it took them, they didn't expect this, but it took them about two years to get the rights to re-release it because Warner Brothers insisted on inspecting the package and listening to the project all over again. Mm. So because it was, even though the material had been released, it was a different company. Mm. So it was like starting from scratch again. Oh. So there was a two year period where, where it wasn't out and then it kind of came out again. And, you know, by that time it had sort of been forgotten in a way. So, yeah. But I do, I do occasionally find somebody that, that has it and enjoys it. So that's nice. I'm going to switch gears here for a moment and talk about other aspects of your your life. Um, let's go back to the beginning. <laughs> you know, you were you were born in England, correct? Right. Yes. And how old were you when you came to the States? I was about three when we came to California. My mother, I was born in the north of England, uh, Lancashire, uh, where my family still are. And um, my mother just got the bug 
to move to California because her uncle was there. Mm-hmm. And he kept saying how wonderful the weather was. And California is a wonderful place to bring up a child. And my mother said, right, we're going. And my dad said, we can't do that. And she said, oh, yes, we can. And about six weeks later, we were there. They'd sold their house, business, car, and we were in San Diego. Um, The funny thing about the car was that my dad was driving along one day in in England, and he got pulled over by a policeman. I don't know why, maybe a taillight out or something. Anyway, he got pulled over, and my dad was a great salesman. He sold the policeman his car right there. (laughs) He said, he said, we're moving to America. Would you like to buy the car? <laughs> I love that. So how did you get from San Diego at three years old to you're starting your career as, as a performer? Right. Well, I think it was, it was just something that I was destined to do. I was always interested in music and interested in television. I remember at at five, we visited Hollywood and I was just absolutely fascinated, you know, walking around the Chinese theater and, you know, standing in film stars, footprints and things like that. And um, I always had the urge to play music, particularly guitar. And mum had taken me to a music store and they said, well, you know, great, but he's just not quite big enough. His hands need to grow a little bit. This was when I was six or seven. So in 64, when I was eight, the Beatles came over and appeared on Ed Sullivan. And they were from Lancashire, like we were. So it was like, right, those are my guys. You know, I felt like I owned them. I felt like they, they were my band. Because my my nana in, in Blackburn had written to me and said, oh, there's this group, they're getting really popular. They're called John, Paul, George, and Ringo. And the kids just love them. And you, you, you love them. Just, you know, look for them, you know. So obviously I did. And it was very exciting. So as soon as I saw them on television, I had to start playing right away. And, and did at eight and started doing little amateur shows. And it wasn't long before I auditioned for a kid's Saturday morning talent show. On, on Channel 13 in Los Angeles, the little mom and pop station, and and went on there and then was seen by some producers and invited to audition for a film. So and that's how that it all the happened. Disney film. No, actually, it was it was a film. I didn't end up uh, getting this part. Um, it was a film with looking for an English boy. Um, Goodbye, Mr. Chips, oh. with uh, Petula Clark and Peter O'Toole. And what happened was they decided ultimately that they were going to cast the boys in England. Mm-hmm. So even though I was a little English boy in California, they were going to shoot in England. And so that didn't happen. Yes. But in the meantime, I got an agent and started being sent out for other things. And the first role I got was playing an English boy on an episode of Combat. Is this number nine, Carrington? Yes, sir. And then and then doing the voice of Christopher Robin um, in Winnie the Pooh yeah. for Disney. You rescued Piglet. I did? Yes, and it was a very brave thing to do. <laughs> Again, that was, oh, well, we, you know, we can tell that The director of the film you mentioned, it was a film called The One and Only Genuine Original Family Band. And we had an Irish director Mm. um, called Michael O'Herlihy. He was the brother of the actor Dan O'Herlihy, if Mm. you remember. Anyway, Michael O'Herlihy, and and we were on the set. And, you know, it was a, funnily, it was a big, big family, again, like the Waltons, except they all played instruments, right? Brass instruments. So that was the, the, plot of that film it was walter brennan and buddy ebsen and leslie ann warren john davidson kurt russell uh, goldie hawn was in it wow she had a dancing role she is an unbelievable dancer wow. um she had like one line in in the film where she giggled as you know she does so well um but her 
character was called the giggly girl. <laughs> that was her role in the film. Uh, but she did this brilliant dancing. And I remember that being at the rehearsals, I'd never seen women, you know, kicking their legs straight up in the air like this. It was just, that's unbelievable. And of course I was this chubby little kid, you know, not, not a dancer and, you know, um, overweight and, and struggling to keep up. You know, when I did my kicks, it was like, eh. but uh, anyway, great, great, great experience. What instrument were you supposed to play in that? I, I was supposed to play the uh, baritone horn, okay. which I didn't play, ah. you know, but, you know, I remember thinking, well, maybe I can, maybe I can learn to play it in time, you know, <laughs> but first day of shooting and I got there, and nothing was coming out and they stuffed cork in the mouthpiece. Oh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, back to, back to the director. Sorry. Um, Michael O'Hurley, um, we had a dinner scene. Sound familiar? There's like eight of us around the dinner table. <laughs> I picked up my knife and fork, my fork in the left hand, my knife in the right hand. And I was eating like this, uh, right? Uh -huh. Everybody else was digging in with the one hand. And he said, I can tell you're from England because it was. <laughs> and you know, that was a little bit of an acting lesson there. The other acting lesson that he taught me and I thought, this is great. I never forgot it. He said, now, John, and he knew I didn't have a lot of experiences now. John, don't act. You don't have to act. Said, All you have to do is listen. Mm. I thought, that's great advice. You know, he was basically saying, don't do anything. Just listen. And you'll, you'll automatically react in a natural way. So I thought that was great. Yeah, that's, yeah, particularly directing children, what a brilliant, simple thing, not asking for a particular reaction, but just letting it be natural. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Cammie and I have talked about that in regards to the Waltons, how how great it was that they let us just be kids, that they didn't, that whatever behavior was happening, she talked about for herself being so young that she'd be doing things she'd like be looking at. She'd just like, you know, go into odd behavior and they just yeah. rather than stopping and going, no, let's do it again. And let's, you know, just stand that they would let all of this natural behavior just happen and why I think we looked so much like just real kids instead of a bunch of little Hollywood actors. <laughs> right, right. Which is great. That is great. I, I do remember, though, I think it was um, when the show came out, we had a review in Time magazine. Mm. And um, which was great, you know, to be in Time magazine. I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty great. But I remember the the reviewers saying, uh, these are not Hollywood actor kids. These are kid kids. And I thought, okay, well, I guess that's a compliment, right? Even though obviously we were actors and we were acting. Uh, I thought, well, okay, I guess, I guess we you know, we're pretty natural then, that's that's good. But he, he referred to me as John Walmsley, who plays the jug-eared Jason. I thought, and I was like 16, 17 at the time, and I thought, what, what a lousy thing to say about, I mean, you know, I thought, well, I'm not gonna take this personally, but I thought, why would you say that to a young person? That's a terrible thing. I was I was thinking like an adult already. That's a terrible thing to say to a young person, you know, and I never forgot that. Wow. Uh, well, it certainly has never hurt your career. You you did you did obviously as a young person, you mentioned you know, doing combat. Yeah, you know, I, I was I was peeking this morning and went, okay, so we had Daniel Boone, we had Adam 12, we had my three sons, and I didn't realize that besides 
voicing Christopher Robin that you also had done quite a bit of other and have done quite a bit of other voice work and voiced a number of characters throughout your career. Um, yeah, I, I couldn't even tell you what they all were at this point, but there was a period of time and it was kind of right before the Waltons um, when I was in high school where I worked at Hanna-Barbera quite a bit. Oh, cool. And would be called in to do various things like um, a character in their version of Oliver or um, Scooby-Doo, a voice in Scooby-Doo, <laughs> which was, you know, those things were, were great because, um, as was uh, Winnie the Pooh, because I was thrown in there with, with all these veteran voiceover actors, mm. which was amazing. And it was just, it was astonishing because, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you experienced this. You work with those people and they're doing like five, six different voices in the same cartoon, mm. going from one to another. It was, it was unbelievable. I mean, the, the, I, I never met him. I, I, I wish I had. The, the prime example, the ultimate example of that was Mel Blanc at Warner Brothers, who did every voice in every cartoon. Wow. In other words, you know, he was Pepe Le Pew, and he was Sylvester the Cat, and he was Foghorn Leghorn, and he was Bugs Bunny, and he was Daffy Duck, and he was Porky Pig. He did them all. Well, how old were you when you voiced Christopher Robin initially? I was uh, 11 when we okay. did that. It was uh, 1967. And when it came out, uh, when Winnie the Pooh and the Blustery Day came out in 68, it actually won the Academy Award for Best Cartoon Featurette. Oh, I didn't get anything, but right. but the studio did. Yeah. Uh, Walt, Walt had already uh, gone by then. He actually, um, I, again, I missed, just missed, uh, knowing him because he he passed away during the audition process for the film. Mm. So um, yeah, just just missed him. He mm. was he was alive when I was auditioning, but um, by the time we started filming, he passed away. Mm. But I but I heard a lot of stories. You know, um, he was a very very hands on kind of guy, and. Um, he walked around a lot and knew everybody, knew everybody's name. He would pop into all the different departments and say, how are you doing? What are you, what are you working on? And he would look at what they were doing and make comments. You know, everybody, everybody liked him. Mm, that's great. Yeah. You don't, um, it's not, it's not, things are not like that anymore in, in the corporate world. Yeah. You know, it's um, it's it's so much more impersonal now. You know, thank goodness for Earl, who was always a guiding hand on the show. Um, yes. It helped, that's, I think, hold the the continuity of it. That's very important to mention, because Earl really was the, the beating heart of the Waltons. And he was the quality control. He was he was so hands on. Yeah. And he was always on the set to discuss a scene or discuss a line or, you know, all of that. And I think, uh, well, you know, we all wanted the show to be good. We we tried to do a good job and 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 try to. Um, it was it was it was a high bar. You know, we definitely thought about that. We we weren't thinking so much about the fact that we would be talking about it over fifty years later, you know, or that there would be this this impact that it would have such an effect on people's lives, and that they would come to us with these wonderful stories about how the show had helped them through this situation or that, or they they had learned something from watching the show, or you know, any any number of things. We that that never entered our minds right in the early days it wasn't until um, much later and and still now we're hearing stories about um you know what effect 
that show had on people. And yeah. and, and good effect. I've never heard anybody say, oh, the Waltons ruined, ruined my life. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for joining me for part three here with John Walmsley. I will see you again for more behind the scenes of the Waltons, more Ask Judy. If you have a question, put it in the comments below. And um, I will see you next time. Thanks for watching.